this is part six of con contradictions in the gospels but like i said we're we're not just looking at contradictions we're also looking at difficulties and that kind of stuff um we are going through let me kind of understand let me just kind of explain to you what's happening we're just going through matthew right now looking for all the difficulties then we're going to go through mark and then luke and then john and then what we're going to do is we're going to go back through um if there's anything that we haven't looked at and compare all four of them for for any other inconsistencies we might not actually have to do that step because we might have already looked at that by the time that we get there going through all the individual gospels so it really just depends how much how much uh progress we make because, I mean, like I said a couple weeks ago when, when I was talking about how some of it is just like the same story, just word is slightly different, and that doesn't make it, like, wrong. Uh, and so that cut out, like, a lot of the con contradictions. So, okay, we are in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5 to 13. This is what it says. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, terribly tormented. Okay, so... Just to make sure that we all know what just happened, he, he he said that a centurion came to Jesus. Okay, all right. Let's look over at Luke chapter 7, and it says this. It's taking me a while to turn there. Luke chapter 7, verse 2 through 10. Now... Listen very closely, and, and I'm sure you'll hear it. Okay, all right, jeez. Uh, now a centurion's slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. Did you guys hear it? Yeah. In Matthew, the centurion came in person. And Luke, it says here, now a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they they strongly urged him. So now we have, um, we have a little bit what seems like a contradiction. We have in one account, we have the centurion doing the talking. And then in the other account, we have... Um, these these group of people talking. Well, what what's the deal? What was it a representative, or was it the centurion himself? Now this is another another example of how culture has changed drastically. So if somebody is sent out by someone else in the ancient culture, they would be considered as that person's voice. Okay. So basically, if I sent out Eli with a message to you know it doesn't matter to give to jamie then you could have said oh michael said so and so but it was actually eli who said the words but eli went under the name of michael and the new testament is actually full of this stuff where it'll say, say in the name of jesus acting in his place we are we are sent out in the name of Jesus. We are we are his ambassadors. We are representatives of him to, to people. And it's the exact same thing here with a, with a centurion. The centurion did not go in person, but he did send a group of people. And so it was like they were acting in his place. It was like he was the one talking. So Matthew can accurately say the centurion said so-and-so, even though he wasn't the one there or talking, and yet still accurately record what happened. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12 says, But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then again, if you look in Revelations chapter 20, verse 14, it says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So it you have this idea of, in Matthew, it says this outer darkness here in verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. And then in Revelations, you have the idea instead of a fire, which by definition has light. I mean, look at my fireplace right now, that there's light coming out of that. And then if you look at Mark chapter 9, verse 48... It says, "... 
where their worm does not die and the fire is not extinguished. Again, the idea of a fire of light. So here's the thing that, that sometimes catches people a little bit off guard about hell. And when Jesus is describing hell, he does it in such a way without everything being literal. He can talk about being thrown out into the outer darkness without it being a place literally without light. He can talk about it being a, a place of eternal flame without it actually having to do with the light or lack of light there. What is the purpose of, of him describing it as a place of, of fire? He's talking about it being a place of torment, a place of pain, a place of not fun. What is the point of him saying outer darkness? A place of being lost, a place of despair. It's, it's a way of describing something without being hyper-literal. So, yes, hell can both be a place of outer darkness and where the flame never dies without really commenting much about what it physically looks like. So what does hell physically look like? I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you actually see something in hell or if it's something that you experience. I don't know. Maybe it's just like... um just a place of complete despair and agony you know when people are in in, in in pain they oftentimes have their eyes closed anyways so maybe it's not something that I don't know maybe they won't actually have physical sight I I, I don't know I, I don't know these are good questions but I don't know the answers <laughs> Matthew chapter 8 verse 20 says this and Jesus said to him that the foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have nests but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So, hold on now. Is Jesus the Son of Man or the Son of God? Why does he keep referring to himself as the Son of Man? It sounds like he's saying, I am not God. And so that's something that just kind of brings up a lot of questions. Here's the thing, though. It's not a denial because he didn't say that he wasn't the Son of God. It's not a question of either or. Was he the Son of Man or, or the Son of God? It was kind of both and. Yes, he was both of those things. And um, he also himself affirmed many times his godhood. If you've, seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, for instance. Nobody has seen the Father, but if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's like, oh, it's kind of hard to argue with that kind of those kind of statements. Um, but when he says son of man, it's more of a statement about him and his purpose. What does it say about Jesus? It says that Jesus came in the flesh, that when he was here on earth, he lived life as a human. Another thing that it says is it says about his purpose. The prophets talked about the Son of Man. It talked about, about the suffering servant and all these different things. And by him saying Son of Man, he was equating himself with that, with the one that was prophesied. So not, not only is he making a statement about himself, he's also making a statement about his purpose. I have come to suffer and die for your sake. So it's it's it, I mean, him calling himself son of man has has, has a lot of a lot of reasons behind it. So that takes us to verse 22, and it says, and you're thinking, wow, there's a lot of verses here. Yeah, but keep in mind that I think it's chapter nine. No, it's not nine. Yeah, it's nine. There's nothing that we look at in nine. We just skip right over it. So it all kind of evens out. Um, in chapter eight, verse 22 says. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. And some people would say, well, that is, that's just plain silly because dead people can't bury dead people. <laughs> and I definitely understand <laughs> I definitely understand what's being said. But here's the thing. The, the heart of what Jesus is saying is it's a question of who are you going to obey? Are you going to – is your family going to come first or is God's kingdom going to come first? So that's the first thing. And he actually talks about this too. He talks about, you know – um, how how family members are going to turn against each other. He talks about you know um, all these different things uh, about how the family connects together. Like for instance, his mom and, and his brothers come to him one time when he's teaching. He says, "Who is my who is my mother? Who is my brothers?" You know, and he goes on to it there. He many times he talks about the way that it's what what is really family, and then he talks about um, uh, choosing between family. Or God's kingdom. So that's the first thing. And then the second point that it, that Jesus is trying to make in this very succinct question of let or statement of let the dead bury their dead is he's saying let the spiritually dead take care of the physically dead. In other words, there are some things that are more important. He's just told this guy, hey, follow me, and this guy's all like, oh, I will. Okay, I I just gotta bury 
bury my dead. And it's like, well, the point being, it's not that it's a sin. It's not that it's a sin to have to bury your 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 loved ones, it's to go to funerals. That's not the point. He's not saying that it's a sin. <laughs> Although I wish that it was. That way I could have an excuse not to go to funerals. <laughs> I hate funerals. Anyways, um, his his whole point that he's getting at here is that he called him to something. He had a purpose for this guy. And instead of following that purpose, he was getting involved with other things. And that, that's something that applies to all of us in life. We can easily get sidetracked with the things that don't really matter but seem important to us. Or we can get focused on God's kingdom. We have the option for either or. Were you going to say something? Yeah, something I just thought of with that one um, is... I, I feel like also it was kind of like a we don't know if his his parents were dead. It could have been like oh once my parents die, mm. I'll bury them and then I'll come follow you once. But I gotta wait till my parents die because I have to get you know. And if he is saying that, that would be an issue of um of honor. So basically, I have to keep um keep submitted under my father until he's until he's dead and then I can obey you. And then, in, if if that's the case, then Jesus' statement would be like, "No, you have to. If, when you have the choice of obeying me or obeying your earthly father, you have to choose me." Yeah. So that that is a possibility, though. Yeah. Were you gonna say anything? Else? No, that was it. Okay. Matthew uh, eight twenty eight says, "And when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, two demon possessed men confronted him as they were coming out of the tombs." They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Now, it goes on with the story, and it says very clearly that there are two demon-possessed men. Okay, so these are actually two different questions. So let's look at the first one first. The first one is, where did this happen? It says, when he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes. Okay, and then he tells a story about these two, two demon-possessed uh, men. And then you get to Mark chapter 5, way over here. And it has things a little bit different. They came to the other side of the sea into the region of the Gerasenes. So you might think, okay, these are maybe two different events. Hold on. When he got out of the boat, which, no, I don't think that these are two different events. There's, there's no reason to think that these are two different events. When he got out of the boat, immediately a, a man from the tombs of an unclean spirit met him. Okay. So we have a, a, two different seeming contradictions. One is a contradiction of where it happened. The other one is a contradiction of how many? So let's let's look at these one at a time. First off, we'll take into the into account the where of it. M Matthew says it, it was the land of the Gedarenes. Mark says there's the land of the Gerasenes. Here's the thing: this is very like likely to be a scribal error of some kind. That when people were 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 copying it and whatnot, they just tried to correct it. You know how sometimes you autocorrect on your phone. Will correct something, and that's not really what you meant. There is a chance that they uh, that they tried to autocorrect, for lack of better words, uh, and fix the error and turned it into um, Gedarenes instead of uh, um, Gerasenes. There is also the possibility that Gadara was the capital, so therefore it would have been the Gedarenes. Um, either way, this is not really a contradiction because the error is in transcription, not in the original. See what I mean? Um, if it was an issue where they were both, Matthew and Mark, were making two separate claims, that would be one thing. But this is most likely a scribal error, so it wouldn't really be a contradiction. It would be the scribe gone done cussed up. See what I mean? And there's no reason to assume that this was an, is an actual error with uh, the original authors themselves, uh, especially since they were both there. <laughs> um but it seems to me like a, like a minor like a minor error. I know some people might get hung up on something like this. I would classify this under the same thing as a, as a minor spelling error. Like spelling Nicole is N I C O L E, or spelling it as N I C H O L, or spelling it as see what I mean. I just don't really think that this is one of those things that's that overly that important. But some people might disagree with me. I don't know. Some people really get hung up about these kinds of things. So the last verse in Matthew chapter eight. 28 verse I mean, to, to 34, 28 to, to 34, it says, oh, I don't have to reread it. This is the same, the, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, the question being, how many uh, demon-possessed people were there? Matthew says there were two, but Mark says there was one. Well, 
Not really. It says that there was a demon-possessed man in Mark, and it says that that demon-possessed man came up to Jesus. It doesn't say that there was one and only one. It never says that um, that there were not two. <laughs> it simply said, it makes the statement that there was a demon-possessed man. So when Matthew says, and more specifically, there were actually two, that's not really a contradiction. It's more of a thing of... This guy was listing how many were actually there. This guy was just listing the one that was doing the talking. So, and also there's a mathematical principle, with, which if you guys did great in math, which I know you didn't, but it's okay. I didn't do great in math either. Uh, there's, there's a rule where there are two, there is one. Yeah. That, 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 that's a fact. Like, where there are two, there, there is one. You, you, <laughs> just because Mark didn't specify and say, by the way... There was also another guy there, or by the way, there was nobody else there. Doesn't mean that there wasn't anybody else there. Well, that's like going to the mall and saying, hey, there, I went to the mall and there was this guy there, and he said this, this, and this. Well, that doesn't mean no one else was at the mall. Right, or that he didn't have anybody standing next to him. Right. Right. So there's nothing really in Matthew chapter 9, so we're just going to skip past it. We might look at, look at parts of Matthew 9 in the future, but nothing right now. Um, so that takes us to chapter 10, and I messed up and see it's supposed to come one at a time. It does not. Mm. I'm fired. Verses uh, 5 through 6. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructed them, saying, Do not go on, on a road to Gentiles, and do not enter a city of Samaritans. So very clearly he says here, not to go to the Gentiles, to only go to Jews, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So then we hop down to chapter 15, verse 24. In the same book, excuse me, and it says this. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. On, there's a Canaanite woman who's at, who asks him to, you know, to, uh, to I think it's heal her son, if I remember correctly. Oh, no, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. And she's asking for him to, to touch her. And he says, I, I, I came to Israel, not, not, to, not to you people. And she says, well, yeah, but I mean... Even even the dogs get to eat the crumbs, and so Jesus is like, okay, your faith is just has just gone done did it. Go on, girl, you got it. <laughs> and uh, but here he clearly makes a statement that he didn't come for everybody, just for the Jews. And then you get into chapter twenty-eight, verse nineteen, and and he says something a little bit different. He says. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now we have a little bit of a different statement. And then if you go to John chapter 10, which is a couple books over, in verse 16 it says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. He's talking to the Jews about the Gentiles. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. The Gentiles will get saved, and they will become part of the flock. Okay? So, this isn't really an issue. It's an issue with understanding Jesus' mission and understanding some basic Old Testament theology. Okay? First off, the place of Israel. Israel was cut off so that the Gentiles could be grafted in. In the future, they will be grafted back in. God is not done with Israelite history. Okay, so we're all clear there. That's something that people have gotten really, really off on. There's all kinds of weird things with the Jews and all this stuff. Um, the place of Jews now and how we all need to revere the, the Jews and all this stuff. It's like, okay, guys, let's take it down a couple notches here. Um, and a lot of Christian literature is, is kind of based on that misunderstanding of, of the place of Jews right now. And a lot of times, like, I'll be teaching a class and I'll say, you can't get to, get to heaven without Jesus. And I'll, oh, yeah, I believe that. Jews who do not accept Jesus don't go to heaven. No, because they're God's chosen people. If you reject Jesus, you reject Jesus. There's, there's no other way through. Like, I don't know what you're, what you're going here. So, yes, they have been cut off. They will not be cut off forever. So that takes us to the next issue. The, the, ba the issue of basic theology concerning Jesus' um, life and character and purpose. And I'll try to make it simple instead of making it complicated. Let me start off like this. Paul wrote in Romans, he said this. He said that first the Jew, then the Gentile. 
Why did he say that? Because the message was given first to the Jews in the Old Testament before it was ever offered to anybody else. And then when Jesus came, he came to the Jews. Then the message was broadened out into the Gentiles. Paul as well, when he went somewhere, he would go to the Jews first. If that didn't work out, he went to the Gentiles. In fact, he eventually switched where his whole mission was the Gentiles. So let's put together some pieces. Jesus, these verses are talking about two different periods of time. In chapter 10, when Jesus says, do not go on a road to Gentiles and do not enter a city of, uh, of Samaritans, what he's saying is that this time our mission is to go to the Jews. That was what Jesus' purpose was. At first he came as a Jew to go to the Jews. Then, in ch chapter 28, verse 19, he's talking, it's a, it's a different time. Something has changed. What's changed? Jesus lived under the law. He died according to the law, was resurrected. The law was set aside, and a new covenant was put forth. So now, we're under that new covenant period, okay? So we're talking about a before and after, whereas before Jesus was coming to the lost sheep of Israel, they rejected him. Now, it's not just to Israel, now it's to the Gentiles as well. See what I mean? So we're talking about two different times. Once again, this is, a, this is an issue that is only an issue if your theology is severely lacking. Once you understand that Jesus' mission was different at different periods, you get the picture. So when Jesus was alive before his death, it was to the Jew. After his death, it was, okay, now, now it's fair game. Real basic concept there, but people really have a hard time with this. Um, now, that takes us to one more point that I want to make about this. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Okay. He knew he was going to be betrayed. It wasn't like, oh, surprise. It's just as a matter of following the, well, God's purpose in it that was what was going on. So, okay, he came. He's like, okay, I know these people are going to, going to abandon me. It's totally fine. To the Jew. Then he died. To the Gentile. So, um, so then, yeah, okay, I already mentioned that. Okay, the next one is in verse 10. Does everybody understand that? Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, verse 10 uh, says, uh, I'll start in verse 9 so it's not in the middle of a sentence. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, or a bag for your journey, or even two tunics or sandals or a staff. Pay attention to that staff bit. For the worker is deserving of his support. And then if you hop over to Mark chapter 6 verse 8, look at what he says about the staff. And he instructed them that they were to take nothing for their journey except a mere staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belt. Did you catch the difference? Mark said, only take a staff. Matthew said, where is it? Matthew said, do not take a bag for your journey or even two tunics or sandals or a staff. So which is it? Did, did Jesus say to take a staff or to not take a staff? Because if you can't, once again, this is actually a contradiction, right? Contradictions are two things that cannot both be. So either Jesus said to take a staff or he said to not take a staff. So how come Matthew says don't take a staff and Mark you got you all got to chill there? And Mark says take a staff. How 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 do you how do you do this? Well, it's not as complicated as it sounds. This is something that doesn't translate well into English is the issue. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 10 it says and I'll I'll make it where you can understand it without having to know Greek. Or a bag for your journey, or even two tunics, or sandals, or staffs. So in Matthew, he's saying not to acquire a second staff. And it is the plural there, staffs. Once again, this does not translate well into English. It sounds like he's saying two separate things. Take a staff and don't take a staff. He's not. He's saying don't take an extra staff in Matthew. And in Mark, he's saying only take one staff. So the idea here is that if your staff breaks... You don't have a you don't have a backup. Why? Because you're you're worthy of the support. Yeah, he makes that click in Matthew. He clarifies, for the worker is deserving of his support. If your staff breaks while you're out doing the ministry, you people should provide for you and get you another staff. You shouldn't have to take a second staff. That's what he's saying. So it's more of an issue of providing for ministers, not so much an issue of don't have a staff at all. Which, once again, that, that's more on the translation's fault. The, peop, translators should really go to it with a critical eye and say, how can I help people who are having a hard time believing in the Bible feel like they can have more faith in it? Because that did sound like a contradiction, didn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Take a staff and don't take a staff. It's like, well, what kind of nonsense is this? If they would have just changed how it was worded, it, it would have been totally understandable. Right. Whatever. Verse 23. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Hold on. When was Jesus going to come? Are you saying that Jesus said, said that they wouldn't finish ministering to the Israelite places and cities before he came again? So they thought that Jesus' second coming was going to be way back then? Well, now hold on. That's not actually what, what he said, okay? First off, I, I got to kind of build on this. First off, Jesus is making a prophetic statement. He's talking about a specific situation, which I'll clarify in just a minute. But it has implications for the future. So now, what is he talking about for now? He's taught, he's telling, sending them out. This is the, 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 the 12 disciples when, we, when he instructs them and sends them out for service, right? And he's saying, go ahead and go. But what's going to happen is as you're, being, as you're going, some places are not going to accept you. And if that happens, this is what I want you to do. I want you to just leave that city and go to the next one. Because you're not going to run out of places to go before I come and meet back up with you and we move on. That's what he's saying. He's not talking about his second coming. He's talking about literally I'm going to come to you. The Son of Man will meet you there. I, I'm, you will not finish your job. Just go out to the cities. You're not going to run out of stuff to do. I'll, I'll meet up with you when, when it's time and we'll go. has nothing to do with the second coming, but it is still a prophetic statement. That means it has implications for later. So if back then it was okay to do this, how much more now? It's, a, it's, a, it's an argument that Paul uses all the time. If this was then, how much more so now? It's arguing from the lesser to the greater. So more of the story being that um, that with something like this, let, let me say it differently. A way, let me say it like this. This is a good way, a good way of saying it. There will always be work for us to do as Christians. There will always be work for us to do. And although t Israel is temporarily cut off, we already looked at that. They will be grafted in again. And so there will always be, we won't run out of things to do, and we shouldn't forget that there will still be people saved, and so we should still go to the Jews and to the, and to the Gentiles both. See what I mean? Because, like, like in, the, in the lesser argument Jesus was making, you won't run out of things to do, how much more so now when we're on a global scale? We will not run out of things to do. Sometimes Christians get a little bit like, eh, a little bit antsy about it, because if, if we minister to the whole world, there won't be anything left to do. You will not. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You won't, won't, won't run out of people to serve. Don't worry about it. Um, so the context seems to be you won't, you won't run out of places to go before it'll be time to move on. So just leave the city if it turns violent. Basically what Jesus is saying is it's not yet time to die for, for, for me yet. Don't be a martyr yet. You will die one day for me. Today's not that day. So if the city doesn't take to you kindly, move on. Um which is something that doesn't necessarily apply to us today. It's sometimes God calls Christians to move out of a situation. Sometimes he calls them to stay. It's a little bit different nowadays. So, any questions on that? No? Okay. Uh, so now we are looking at the last uh, part in Matthew chapter 10 that has a problem. And that will take us, guys, all the way through Matthew chapter 10. How awesome is that? And uh, it's going to be a lot easier going once we get all the way through Matthew because there's a lot of overlap between Matthew, Mark, Luke. So um, not a whole lot of contradictions past that. It'll just become more, more of um, difficulties of what the heck does that even mean. Um, and then looking at things like, like I was talking about with um, Jesus said, hey, nobody is good except for the Father. And then he says, the good bring from, from their good stores. And it's like, well, how can I bring from good stores if I'm not good? <laughs> Stuff like that. So we'll look at that, though. So, uh, so the last part in chapter 10 that, that's, that is a difficulty here. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, hold on. Did Jesus come to bring peace or war? And see, this is something, another thing that is oftentimes overlooked, right? Because Christmas time, right? Um, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. That is a whole big thing in and of itself that I wish we had time to look at tonight. But the idea being that Jesus' coming didn't guarantee peace for all of us. It brought it brought the possibility of peace. So I wish we could look at that more. But all, all, what I can say for now is concerning this, this is an issue of purpose or design. 
He came to bring peace. That was his purpose or his design. Okay, that's what, what the goal was. But the purpose is not the same as the result. The result was war and betrayal. See, Jesus bringing the cure is what caused war and betrayal. What, what caused those family members to turn, and turn against each other? Believing in Jesus. So although they, they inherited peace in this life at that moment, and in the next life they'll have a greater peace, they are still having to deal with the war and betrayal in the middle. So just like in this life how there's going to be troubles, but we can still have peace that's not like the world the peace that the world gives, same kind of concept here. We can have peace in this life, and in the next, dear in, uh, I'm sorry, and in the next life, and dear in, and through the process of war being around us, we can still experience peace. So a concept that I want to kind of say that will maybe help you understand what I'm saying, to heal a leg sometimes, you sometimes have to cut it off. If it's, if it's real sick, sometimes to make that body well, you have to cut the leg off. Sometimes when a doctor looks at your body, something will be so screwed up that they have to inflict a lot of pain to, in order to get you, the, get you the cure to make you feel better. Yeah. It's not something they're trying to do. Think of, okay, here's a good example. When you have cavities, not like in your case where things just didn't really work out. I'm talking about in, in a normal tooth. When you don't take care of it and you eat a bunch of junk food, you're going to have cavities. And that cavity hurts. That's the situation. That would be the state of the world when Jesus came. Okay, But in order for that dentist to fix that cavity, they have to do something painful called giving you a shot. right? That would be Jesus, um, that would be Jesus what, what Jesus does. Bringing the possibility. Sorry. Uh, bringing the possibility, but in order to get better, you have to get that shot. And that's kind of what, kind of what it's like. Um, did the surgeon come – when a surgeon comes to cut off a leg that, that, that's making the whole body die, did the surgeon come to heal or to cut it off? Well, to heal by cutting it off. It's kind of one of those things. So did Jesus come to bring peace? Yes, but war has to come. Why? Why does war have to come? Because that's, how, that's the way things work. People work like that. Did you guys ever notice that in stories there's always a violent character? Why? Because violence is in our character. She might say, well, why is the Old Testament so, so filled with violence? Because people are filled with violence. It's the same thing with this. Jesus came to bring peace. Yes. But in so doing, it brought war by necessity because people are evil. They just, That's just what happens. Like In an ideal world, they'd be like, okay, you want to you go to heaven and you want to love Jesus, and that's totally fine, and I want to go to hell and I want to reject Jesus. That's totally fine too. But we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where people don't do like that. They hate God. They, they oppose his work. And that's just how it works. So any, any questions on any of this? Because we are finished for tonight. Everybody good? Okay, so next week we will be watching another one of the uh, Mounts videos where he talks about why I trust the Bible. Well, it'll be chapter 3, so if you have the book, Why I Trust the Bible by Bill Mounts, it'll, we'll be going over chapter 3. If you don't have the book, don't worry about it. The video will explain enough where you really don't need to read the book. So, um, Okay, so if there's no questions, we're going to go ahead and close out.